Okay, I can see that it has record on it. Well, the first confirmed instance that we have that we know for sure would have been my granny, my father's mother, and she had been uh, misdiagnosed, I believe as Alzheimer's at the time. But my parents were coming home one day and I were, they were called listening to a radio show and they were describing a new condition that was discovered at Huntington's. And the symptoms that they gave were so eerily accurate to my granny that they, uh, they thought that's something they should investigate. And that's actually how we found out. That's how it came into our family. Now, my dad then went for the test and he would have been diagnosed in 1999. I would have been eight years old at the time. My next sister was 10, my next sister was 12. By 2001, he had to leave work because he's he just came, uh, simply couldn't continue on with his job. And so he was home a lot of the time. And that's when it really started to hit home for me because we had to run our house like a military boot camp pretty much. Um, someone had to be with my dad at all times, no matter what. By the time I would have been about nine turning 10 at that stage, I was making dinners for my dad. I was making his tea, I was cleaning up after him. I actually learned how to shave by shaving my own dad because he couldn't do it anymore. I used to brush his teeth for him. I mean, that's probably one of the better ways I could describe my relationship with my dad is that it completely reversed the roles where most young men would learn how to shave by the dad showing them. I learned how to shave by shaving my dad. I learned a lot of um, the big life skills that typically your father would teach you by carrying them out for him. So that's where it really started to just come home to me that what situation I was really in, you know. Since he couldn't be left alone. It meant that if I wanted to go out, but there was no one available to watch my dad, I was staying in. That was just the end of that. And it made having relationships with friends kind of difficult, particularly because you don't always want to tell them what's happening in your life. Because, you know, you get a bit sick of telling everyone and uh, they say, oh, that's terribly sorry. And it feels as if you kind of have a wall between you and your friend. You know, they're always afraid they're going to say the wrong thing or walking on eggshells, you know. So it can have quite a profound effect on your ability to make and maintain friends because you simply don't have enough free time as you normally would. When you go for the test and when you find out if you have the condition or not, you're not actually finding out. It's already been decided. That dice has already rolled. So really what I was doing was just confirming what is already my reality and that what was going to happen was going to happen no matter what I did. So the best thing I could do was just do it, just find out. Because at the very least I knew what future I was facing down and I would be better equipped to deal with it. And I think I made that realization about, yeah, about 16, 17, where I was galvanized in my mind that I was gonna find out as soon as possible and come hell or high water, I was gonna have to find a way to deal with it. So the day um, I found out, I was with my mother and my uncle, and he was my godfather. We went into the hospital. Now the whole time I'm walking in, I'm trying to, I psych myself up almost. I'm trying to imagine like, you know, if it's gonna be really good news, like, you know, don't go jumping at your, at your seed screaming with happiness or something. If it's gonna be bad news, just try to keep it together, you know? Don't go falling apart. And I had all these scenarios going in my head of how it might go. And we got in, we sat down in the office and a lady named Rose came in and she put this sheet on, just a sheet, one sheet of paper. She just put it on the table in front of us and said, it's good news. And then she turned and left. Then for me, I didn't actually get that moment that I thought I would. I didn't have a moment of happiness. I wasn't ecstatic. It was the next day when reality began to set in and I was able to process the situation a little bit more. 
that's when I really started to unravel how I felt about the situation. That on one hand, I was happy. Of course I was happy, who wouldn't be? On the other hand, it was actually a tremendous amount of guilt because when, in, when you're in a family and to each child has a 50-50 chance of having the condition, it can be a difficult thing for a family to really, uh, just to cope with that, to process that, you know? Ah, there you are, there you go. There I am. How are you doing? Uh, Bernie, you're making me feel bad. Look, I'm after getting my plants lined up, but you're making mine look terrible by comparison. Look at the setup you got. Yeah, well, you know, a girl's got to do. I don't have a beard well, yet. <laughs> so my Auntie Bernie, how to describe her? Um, more than likely, I would describe her as a bit of a free spirit. Very kind, very relaxed, very laid back. She's just so chilled out and she just knows how to get get everything done, get problems sorted. And yeah, no, couldn't, uh, couldn't speak highly enough better, really, to be honest. But Sean, in all the years that you cared for Donal, mm -hmm. did you ever get overwhelmed with it yourself? Um, well, well, yeah. I mean, I'd be lying if I said no, wouldn't I? Um, I think it's just though, like, it kind of depends though, because what I found funny was, um, I was never overwhelmed by caring for dad or situations with dad. The funny thing was I would become overwhelmed when when I was on my own, on my own private time. Because at the time, like when you're caring for dad, you're so focused on just getting it done. You know, all you're thinking is just do it. But it's only afterwards in your quiet time when you have a chance to absorb all the information do you realize, oh Jesus, you know? Yeah, this is monumental, yeah. Your dad was so well cared for. You or Ashling or Gronya or Anne were by his side all the time. He was never on his own. You're such a caring, tight-knit family and you were so invested in Donald. There was definitely um, an element of resentment in my early years, but it was never directed at my father, never. There was no reason for this to happen to him. He didn't deserve it and we didn't deserve it, but yet, you know, here we were. And so there was resentment against the situation itself and all the sacrifices our family had to make and the trials and tribulations we had to go through. It's taught me um, definitely resilience. You'd be surprised how much you can take when your back's put up against the wall. When you've lived through this life, you can amaze yourself. You really can, with what you can take and what you can, uh, what you can struggle through. It really teaches you to figure out what is actually important and what isn't. <laughs>